Welcome back to Media 7, where I'm discussing perception and reality in the European debt crisis with Giovanni Tizzo and Rod Oram. Rod, um, we should probably ask why uh, this thing that's happening on the other side of the world is important to us in New Zealand. Why does it matter to us? Three main impacts. The first one is that if financial markets get um, a good deal rougher than they are now, then the cost of borrowing by um, our banks will go up and therefore the cost of lending will go up here. And um, our economy is weak at the moment. We might be lucky to get about 1.5% growth this year um, and therefore that would be a dampener on our economy. Secondly, this is causing so much um, uncertainty around the world that um, companies are sitting on extraordinary um, strong balance sheets. They are, they've been paying down debt, they've been saving their money because it's all looked pretty difficult out there in the world over the last few years, um, but they're not making capital investments. Um, and so um, the global economy is kind of a bit stuck in that sense. And the third one is the demand side for us. Um, although we get very few tourists from Greece, we actually get um, a lot from Germany who are long staying, high spending uh, tourists, um, but similarly elsewhere from around Europe. So this causes, uh, creates such a, a pall over sentiment generally um, that we could accept, uh, expect weaker demand. Then you could, so the, the, those are the three immediate ones, then you could start to theorise about other ones. So, for example, um, China has zoomed up to become our second largest trading partner, and if this continues, they'll overtake Australia in aggregate exports and imports in only a matter of three or four years. But um, Chinese, the Chinese financial system we has all sorts of signs of being pretty parlous, lots of bad debt, lots of overextended um, property development and the rest. So if this goes horribly wrong in Europe um, that then has um, some impact on China um, then and the Chinese economy starts to get into difficulty, um, then that has a much more direct impact on us. So we, we, is we this will, global connectivity? We will occasionally see a politician uh, or a business leader reported here saying uh, we have to knuckle down and embrace budget cuts otherwise we will be like Greece or Italy or Spain. Is, is that a realistic? We're not in that position are we? Um, the government is um, choosing to mix up two different things. Um, uh, it's chosen to focus on its own um, budget deficit which is um, an interesting issue to work on uh, that needs to be done and the credit rating agencies want some comfort there is a track to to get um, our books back into um, balance um, but our government debt as a percentage of GDP um, is down in, in so sort of the bottom third of the OECD it's low but the real problem for New Zealand is uh, is our 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 real the, the really important external deficit, which is our net international liability. So we run um, current account deficits because we don't earn enough from exports and we've got all this money flowing out of the country from foreign-owned businesses, their profits, or from all the debt we have. Our banks borrow and then lend to us. Lots of that money flows back out of the country. Or we sell off assets, all that kind of stuff. So our net international liabilities are the third highest in the OECD um, after Iceland and Hungary. Um, one last thing is that um, in terms of GDP um, per person per hour worked, in other words, how productive are we, um, are, uh, we're actually less productive than the Greeks. But don't worry. Who are massively <laughs> less don't, productive don't, than don't, the Germans. Exactly, but don't worry because we've got, we're massively efficient at producing low-value things and we do it really well. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic. Things like milk powder, logs, you name it, we've nailed it. <laughs> Um, and um, so uh, the financial markets are not worried about our ability to keep earning a living and keep paying, um, servicing our debt, whereas they obviously worry about Greece. Um, so um, we, are, we are not vulnerable to being the next Greece, um, but we have to take those, um, uh, the imbalances in our own economy very seriously. Um, and just as we don't, we're saying we don't have full measure of what's going on with Greece. Um, I, I don't think we have full measure of what's going on in New Zealand in that sort of bigger perspective. And you certainly don't hear the government talking in that way. It's very much focused on its own budget deficit and saying, oh, we're going to do more on exports and that kind of stuff. But you, this doesn't feel like a government that's really focused on that, on that bigger external picture. Giovanni, uh, clearly this is a far more acute issue for the southern European countries, mm. including your, your homeland, Italy. Are people becoming literate about this situation because they have to? Oh yes, I, mean, I, I, um, I wrote in that piece of the title that 
the word spread. You know, my mother has turned 80 last year and there was absolutely no word of English she could speak. Now she knows that word very well. And that is the word that describes the, the differential and the interest that you pay in your debt compared to the Germans. So if it is 290 points, it means Germans pay two, you pay about five. Uh, it goes up to 400, 500, you, you, you're looking at the essentially uh, uh, economic collapse around the corner. And this is the kind of thing that people talk about over coffee? They talk now. about it over coffee and, and it's, uh, it's kind of a number that, that measures your temperature, the, the temperature of your economy every day. Well, so what's that doing to national and media sentiment? What, what is the mood in those countries? Massively hard done by, I think probably will describe Greece quite well, but I know Italy better. And I think in Italy the sentiment is slightly more contradictory. I think there is a because the narrative has been quite successful, this, this narrative about the fecklessness, the fact that we're living beyond our means, um, I think we've accept, we're accepting from the current government things that, that we wouldn't have accepted in ordinary circumstances. And we fear that Greece is the next step um, in, in a way that, um, that is possibly unwarranted, but also it creates political uh, softening of the political right. will. <clears throat> right, we're at the part of, this, of the discussion now where I ask you both, uh, what do we do? What's the solution? <laughs> Um, yeah, I'm not going to be the one who says let's give capitalism another crack, but um, <laughs> at the same time I think if, say we just take Greece, um, if we're looking at the, a movement there where people are saying well we should just default, I think that's way too easy on the EU. I think the EU should look at, you know, if you want to call, it, call them reparations because it's, it's too fraud a word, you can certainly call it mutuality and you can call it solidarity and you can see if the Debt can be shared around in, in some way, and euro bonds are something that is, that is, that is mooted, but uh, the political will for it uh, doesn't seem to be there. Rod, is this late stage capitalism? Uh, yes, and I'm not sure what capitalism 2.0 looks like. <laughs> <laughs> the ability for um, politicians and um, bankers and central bankers and all the rest to deliver a, a structured, sound solution to this, um, I think, is virtually zero. It would be relatively easy for Greece to um, default and leave the uh, Eurozone, but it would be horrendous. So, for example, um, the value of the new drachma would plunge and inflation would be extraordinarily high in Greece. Um, it would... It, it, and it's... The economy would become very competitive quite quickly, but it would be a very much poorer country. Um, so between the two is kind of the game that's being played out, which is about trying to play the long game, um, not knowing that there really isn't a clear solution in sight, but if you can just get investors in the markets kind of slightly inured and not relaxed, but adjusted to um, write down of debt and other adjustments, then um, that's going to happen in a more orderly way. And, it, and it's sort of a parallel, but I, I wouldn't want to stress the parallel too much, but that's exactly what was happening in the United States in late 2008 and 2009 with General Motors. Um, because um, Obama had been elected president, but obviously wasn't sworn in until late January 2009, but he was already working on plans to sort of save General Motors. It would have been catastrophic if General Motors had gone bankrupt that Christmas of 2008. Um, and yet, by just sort of playing the long game, giving them enough support to sort, them, sort themselves out a bit, um, it then went into a very orderly bankruptcy proceedings um, and then was quickly at the other side. So a short version, keep calm and carry on? Um, uh, it's imp almost impossible to keep calm, um, but certainly to carry on. Yes. <laughs> Thank you both, gentlemen. <laughs> Now, when the French film The Artist won Best Picture at this week's Academy Awards, it became the first silent film to do so since the very first winner 83 years ago. Can you name that first winner? Jose Barbosa knows. If you've always dismissed the annual Academy Awards as little more than a circus designed to appeal to the vanity of gussied up mouth breathers... I'm 70. See, this one wobbles. Well, turns out you were totally correct. MGM studio head Louis B. Mayer created the award solely as a way to lead talent around by the nose. If I got them cups and awards, they tell themselves to produce what I wanted. That's why the Academy Awards was created. The modern ceremony takes six weeks to complete and has beamed directly into everyone's brains. But the first Oscars held in 1929 were quite different. At five bucks a head, 270 guests dined at the Roosevelt Hotel. There were no speeches. 
The award ceremony itself was only 15 minutes long, moderated with efficiency by Douglas Fairbanks. The Best Picture recipient, Wings, was the first and until this year, the only silent film to receive the honour. It's considered the last great film of the silent era, mainly because it ended things with a bang. Wings was directed by William A. Wellman, at the time an unknown quantity, seemingly chosen because of his experience as a World War I pilot. He turned out to be a good choice because Wings ended up creating movie history. Its flying scenes are fantastic, being the first time cameras were fixed to an airplane. But they needed to be operated by the two lead actors, Charles Rogers and Richard Arlen, who actually flew the planes. Rogers had never flown before, and even though they trained him, he was so terrified he threw up after every flight. It was notable for starring Clara Bow, who was literally the original It Girl, and also for being one of the first films to show people in the nud. It also has the honour of being the first film to show a kiss between two men. Platonic, mind. Wings pretty much set up the template for the summer blockbuster film as we know it. It's still quite impressive, if a bit dated. But it's gained a lot of charm in the preceding 84 years. And it's a reminder that our entertainment needs haven't evolved. Pretty girl, handsome dudes and lots of explosions. In other words, a lucrative distraction. Jose Barbosa there, and that is really doing your own stunts. And that's our show. Thanks again to Giovanni Tizzo and Rod Orham, and to you for joining us. We'll be back with Media 7 at the same time next week. Until then, goodbye.